I was opposed to Obama's deal with Iran from the beginning. Um, no one could restrain me here in uh, Australia in opposing it because it's a danger not just to Israel and to Jews or whoever, it's a danger to the peace of the world. And um, um, I even had a huge billboard in uh, St Kilda, in the St Kilda Junction, um, which uh, made Julie Bishop very, very unhappy with a picture of her uh, and the Iranian leader. Welcome to Frank Talk. Uh, I'm Albert Dadon, your host. Today I've got uh, Michael Denby, who's usually my co-host, but today uh, he is uh, the person that I'm interviewing. Michael has been in the news lately because of all the uh, topical things that are happening uh, with the Labour Party, uh, in particular the, uh, the Victorian Labour Party, but not just the Victorian Labour Party, also on the federal level. Uh, welcome to you, Michael. Thanks, Albert. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Um, Michael and I have been friends for a long time. I think it's over 20 years. And uh, for the whole time that Michael has been in Parliament, uh, I believe I have never met someone else like Michael who stands by his views. He's a champion of uh, minorities. Michael, in many respects, uh, would put his values and... Uh, uh, justice uh, well ahead of his own career. It doesn't make you popular with um, with uh, former leaders, um, um, Rudd and uh, people like that who uh, criticise you for um, uh, being inflexible and um, uh, not agreeing to go up the greasy pole according to their methodology. Although uh, I think that the disagreement with Rudd, you probably wear that as a badge of honor, but uh, I, I am uh, a witness to say that all successive Prime Ministers of Australia have held you, maybe at the exception of Kevin, but they all hold you in the highest esteem. I'm not sure about Mark Latham, but again, that was a, that's a badge of honor too. Um, what's going on in Victoria? We're talking about uh, COVID-19. We're in confinement. You can see that we're in confinement by the state of my hair. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> what, what, the, what, the, what, the, what's going on? Uh, this second lockdown is very serious, as that um, Chief Medical Officer Sutton suggests. It's possible that the, uh, via community spreading that this could uh, COVID nineteen could uh, break out. It's contagious. There are clusters even at the Alfred Hospital near nearby to uh, to me here. So it's a very serious situation. And unfortunately, I think it was uh, largely avoidable. Um, you and I may have had differences about uh, Dan Andrews and the first lockdown being insufficiently considerate of the economy. Uh, he did it very harshly, um, but people supported him uh, like they did with some of his infrastructure plans. They voted for him at the last election, despite him spending a billion dollars on cancelling that um, link to the Eastern Freeway. So you've got um, uh, a really serious situation here. And I think the key question was asked by, um, of all people, Gay Alcorn in the gar left wing Guardian today, who starts to raise doubts about why did this happen? And uh, that, that uh, is really the question about um, why did we decide to have security guards at home? the hotels where international travellers were coming rather than a mixture like they have in other states supervised by the police or the uh, uh, the army. Is it, do you have any insights as to how the Andrews government is the only one in Australia that rejected uh, the help of the federal government when it comes to the Australian Defence Forces? This was offered to all states and we can now see the net results. All the states are now opening their borders. They basically squashed uh, the coronavirus totally. And we are in Victoria. It feels like if we are in New York, places like that. Well, Albert, it may be that the, um, this second uh, lockdown will squash it. Let's hope that we don't go in the direction of Florida or, or New, York, New York earlier. But um, uh, the National Cabinet has worked very well. It surprised me, actually, how 
uh, these state premiers uh, and the Prime Minister worked very well to date. But the offer of the army should have been accepted. Look, any normal common sense uh, attitude, it's being accepted now. Uh, it should have been accepted earlier. And if it's true that at the state cabinet, the, the police minister said that uh, she didn't want the police to supervise these um, um, private security guards, that was clearly a mistake. Um, these people are not trained. These people have uh, had illicit relations uh, reportedly with um, some of the hotel guests. And that's what spread it all over the community. So, it, you know, maybe we're very on that, Michael, because not only did she not want the police to supervise the hotel guests, she did not want the police to share their powers with the Australian Defence Forces. Well, there is a problem because legally, um, the um, ADF have to be present with uh, police because they do not have legally the powers to arrest or detain or to stop people. Um, so the, the two of them would have to be present. And um, I think that would have been uh, the situation. Uh, look, you need... Uh, that would have uh, made it totally avoidable. Let's be clear. That by itself would have made it totally avoidable. Albert, you weren't present at the state minutes and you don't know what they actually decided. But you're right. If that's what they decided, it was wrong. Um, well, obviously, but, uh, that's what they decided because we know the outcome. They refused the defence forces. What, uh, uh, what my question was: How did they get to that? Uh, so we don't know because neither yourself nor myself were there. Uh, what we can only uh, say is what we're hearing from uh, people that are close to the action, and uh, it seems to me that uh, what you said there uh, is, is corresponds to what I've heard elsewhere. So there is a, uh, there is a fault that falls squarely on the head of this government. And now the other thing uh, that I, my issue and that I want to ask you, and I know you and I don't agree on this, I believe that the economic pie is been shrinking. Uh, it doesn't seem to worry uh, this uh, premier and this government to shrink that, that pie. Um, but Albert, you can't all argue that you know um, he's shrinking the pie and then criticising him at the same time for opening up and um, not supervising uh, uh, the the hotels. I, I think he was right. No, no, to no, no, no. That's got that's two completely different uh, arguments. You can have both. Uh, you do. You can chew gum and walk at the same time. So yeah, I think we got to a very good situation prior to this second lockdown, where we, we you know, we, we nearly got back to starting to open up the economy. Um, uh, but uh, we, we can't do it now because um, health wise, this is jeopardizing uh, people because of a completely unnecessary spread. Um, just look at, look at Queensland. You probably would like to be on holidays in Queensland. Um, it's warmer there, you know. Um, it's terrible to be in Melbourne during this uh, harsh winter, um, lockdown like like this. But um, uh, the, the economy is is one issue, and the unnecessary, po possibly unnecessary lockdown uh, the second time because of the hotel guards spreading the uh, disease out to their communities in the north and west of Melbourne is another issue. Okay, uh, we we uh, have. Uh... Uh, um, a situation here that, as I said, was avoidable, but at the same time, you know yourself that the hotel is not the only reason why this thing has spread. There were also the 10,000 or more people that the Premier has allowed in the street for demonstrations. Uh, and then there is all the fallout of all of this, which is his refusal to answer as to what is happening, the return government totally um, uh, is finding ways of not being accountable. Example, they suspended parliament. Second example, they, um, the premier has put a commission, has declared a commission inquiry where there's one retired judge that is now used 
as an excuse for them to say there is a commission of inquiry, therefore we can't answer any questions. Uh, Alvin, and you're it, skipping from so one thing to the other so quickly. I, I won't remember all of these things unless no, no, I... But I'm, not ask, I'm not asking you to remember. Uh, I'm enumerating them because uh, they, it's all very important. Uh, yeah, but can I just stop you for no, one but wait, point? Wait, you're not letting me uh, set my scene. You're not letting me uh, telling you uh, how uh, I see the pattern. Uh, the pattern to me is very similar to that of China. There is a, a, a pattern here. Uh, you've got the premier of Victoria who's the most close to the Chinese. He is the one who uh, declared uh, that Silk Road, you know, that it's, he signed an MOU, the Belt yeah. Road Initiative. And, and so, I'm against it too, and I think that's a separate issue. It's, uh, to me, it's all a, a, a similar issue because he's kind of very, very close to the Chinese. Uh, every minister is asked to travel to China every second year. Uh, and the only minister who has not traveled to China, and that's where I'm bridging to where I want to take you, the only minister that has not traveled to China was Adam Samurak. And that's the guy that has been sacked. LB, you've covered so many different issues. Like, <laughs> first of all, let me say that um, the hotel guards issue is more serious than the Black Lives Matter demonstration. I completely disagree with those irresponsible people who gathered for that and who uh, had a, a small transmission of the disease. But uh, that also happened in New South Wales. And uh, Glenis, uh, the Premier there, let uh, Bajerki and let that happen as well. Um, and um, that's not the, 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 the serious source of the disease. Um, Andrews may be wrong, and the decisions of his cabinet um, to uh, um, supervise the hotel overseas returnees in this particular way um, may be wrong, indeed is wrong. But uh, he's, he's not a Chinese dictator yet. If, however, you're saying that democratic principles in Victoria are not of the highest standard that they should be, I think that the parliament was scheduled not to sit during this winter break anyhow. I don't think it was deliberately not sitting. But it, in fact... Michael, that, you, are, you, are you are incorrect right there. So the parliament was definitely scheduled to sit. And it's a very recent decision. Uh, following the outbreak that they made that decision. Apparently, uh, Andrews is uh, saying that he was not aware of this. But uh, whether that's true or not... Uh, it really well, I think if you're think. referring to that parliamentary committee, exactly. they, they should, again, allow, been allowed to sit. I'm not trying to deflect the facts or deflect criticism. What uh -huh. I'm saying is they should be criticised for what they've done, done, not for what they're not. But so there is a pattern. The Black Lives Michael, demonstration. Michael, there is a pattern. The pattern is that they're not telling you the medical advice. We don't know what their medical advice is. We don't know if it is even has any basis in science. We have no idea. It's, the whole thing is so opaque. Uh, I feel that I'm living in a dictator country, in a banana republic. You seem well, to be okay with that. I'm not okay with that. I, I think that you're getting the same kind of information from the, the medical officer here as you're getting from the medical officer in Canberra. And if you, if you don't think there's enough information, that's an absolutely fair enough point of view. Let's, let's talk about what we have in common on this, and that is we should say there should be more democratic supervision of what's going on. You referred to Somirak. I don't think it's fair that uh, um, the Belt Road Initiative can no longer be criticised in Victoria because the national executive has abolished the rights of all Victorian Labor Party members when they suspended and sacked Mr. Somirak. What happened with Samirak? Can we go back to that story? Um, there's a famous scene in Casablanca, uh, the great film, um, Albert, when uh, the French uh, Lieutenant Colonel who's supervising the casino says that he's shocked, he's shocked to hear that there's gambling in this casino. Now, that's the same with uh, 60 Minutes. They're shocked that um, there's branch stacking in, uh, um, I, was walk I was on my bike going down Ormond Road, uh, Elwood the other day. And I was thinking to myself, that's the flat where a leading minister in the Victorian government lived, um, allegedly, uh, when they were trying to branch stack against me before my pre-selection. Um, 
I know uh, the place in Ormond Esplanade where uh, she and her husband allegedly lived. So this branch stacking thing has been something that's been going on for since the since the beginning of time. The and real quick is that let's be clear, it's running on all parties. Exactly, and that it's the political consequences of Somirak's removal that, that really I think hasn't been focused on enough. And one of them is that there's no resolution critical of the Belt Road Initiative that was going to be uh, discussed at that state conference. Albert, you'll be uh, amused to know that the right-wing union, the shop assistance union, uh, together with the, the left-wingers, the CFMEU, were going to co-sponsor a resolution critical of that. Uh, it, that won't be discussed now. Um, Senator Kim Carr, who was not going to be pre-selected for the Senate, he will be back the most pro-China senator in the Australian Senate because of the removal of Somirak. Mr. Somirak was quoted as saying he learned all of his uh, um, abilities about branch work, as he cutely called it, from Anthony Byrne. Now, um, I remember when um, Anthony Byrne came over from South Australia here, he didn't have a lot of uh, uh, support in that uh, electorate and he had to uh, recruit some members in order to, uh, uh, to win it. He did, um, but it's the falling out with Somirak now that's much more of interest. Um, Albert, what kind of stage are we getting to when officers of federal MPs have videos installed in them and people who are uh, having conversations in there. You could be talking about a, a confidential family law matter or a business uh, a matter that you want help with your federal MP from regarding a tax office or something like that, that it's recorded and then used on television. Um, look, if it's legal, it's certainly not ethical. And, um, you know, uh, I, I can't understand how people are just able to wash their hands of the whole uh, consequence of what Byrne uh, did um, and uh, how he allowed those cameras into his office to secretly record Somirak. And the contrast, Albert, is I, I don't think the Premier uh, was involved in it, nor was the leader of the opposition. Um, uh, they may have known about it a few days beforehand. But here in Victoria, 15,000 Labor Party members uh, have lost all of their political rights for three years. And the crooks in New South Wales, I mean, uh, oh, they, they are left completely uh, untouched. Let's look, look at New South Wales quickly. We've had Sam Dastiari lose his position as a senator because mm. he sung the Chinese line about the South China Sea. We've had yeah. uh, two general secretaries of the Labor Party, Kayla Manane and Jamie Clement, appear before the um, Independent Commission Against Corruption. Um, and only recently, we've had the first ever raid on a New South Wales Labor um, uh, MP, um, Sharket Muslim, and someone compares him to Sancho Panza and to uh, Bob Carr to uh, Don Quixote. That's the close relationship between the two. If you look on Google, you'll see the two of them go back uh, uh, at, at, at 10 years. Those people um, need a clean out. Um, there's an expression in, in English, clean the Augean stables. We need to clean the Augean stables in New South Wales. People are, uh, if we're seriously concerned about the accretion of Beijing's influence in Australia, mm -hmm. it's in Sydney, not in Melbourne. Um, so we have a serious issue with COVID here. I agree with you. And it needs to be addressed and looked at fairly. But well, in Sydney, the there's a political it's problem. The methodology around the whole thing that needs to be really scrutinised. But we will one day, because this thing has a, has a life of its own. At some point, uh, the, the democratic process will come back. Do you know, Albert, that uh, do you know, Albert, that these uh, uh, hearings of ICAC are not finished, and that they will come out with uh, decisions about those two? And we yeah, but, uh, Michael, you're going, ahead, you're going ahead a little bit too fast. I need to slow okay. you down as you slowed me down before. Thank you. Uh, because I want to understand um, Anthony Albanese, the Labour leader, uh, he had to agree um, to, to fire Adam Samarak. And I would 
uh, understand that he did that because Adam is not of his faction, he's on the right side, and Anthony Albanese is on the left side. Um, but he also, they also called in the, uh, uh, the administrators for the Labour Party in Victoria. Now, what is it that would stop Anthony uh, doing the same thing for the New South Wales Labour Party? Political alliances. Um, if you look, for instance, um, at a function that Mr. Sharket Musselman ran before the last federal election in April. There's a report of it in, of all places, Albert, a Pakistani newspaper. Um, so it's a public source document. You see there, um, Albo sitting with his friends in the New South Wales right at a uh, Friends of uh, Palestine um, uh, fundraiser. Uh, now, to me, that's not the, wouldn't have been the top issue before the federal election. Um, yes, they were there, um, uh, him and Tony Burke with uh, Sharket Musliman. The New South Wales right, apart from some good unions like the SDA and the AWU, are riven with uh, corruption. We've seen uh, Eddie O'B, we've seen all of the events that have happened in New South Wales. And um, uh, Albo, for whatever reasons, is very close to some of those uh, leading people in the New South Wales right. They're the ones who should be examined by the Australian political system. They're the ones who should be, should be chased by 60 Minutes and by the Sydney Morning Herald. But uh, they all sit on their hands and yes. uh, accept it as if it's uh, uh, laissez-faire. Let, uh, it's, let a, it's, a more, it's a more complex issue than, than a sim the simple alliance of left and right because effectively the ones that seem to be the, the pro-Chinese, pro-Palestine and so on, they are on the right side of politics in New South Wales, aren't they? And uh, yet well, uh, some of them is not on their, sec on their faction. Some, some, of the, some of them are. Um, as I said, there are many honourable people in New South Wales who don't support Hamas, uh, who don't support uh, Beijing um, and um, who are not soft on them like some of the people that we have there. I'm very pleased that my vision of um, uh, human rights legislation, uh, which is called Magnitsky legislation, passed all around the world, um, that Penny Wong professed recently in the Sydney Morning Herald that um, Labor is now going to support it. I actually introduced it into Parliament um, in February uh, before I finished. Um, and um, I'm the one who's been, been pushing it all the way back since... Um, uh, since those days when it was uh, supported in principle by the Adelaide Labor Party conference. But um, the, the, I'll, I'll be, you can't ignore the fact that Anthony Albanese has done the right thing when it comes to the extradition treaty with Hong Kong, with uh, uh, military procurements that Australia needs to protect itself, or with uh, general criticism of uh, Beijing's aggression. So um, it's, it's a, um, a very um, mixed uh, picture and um, uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Anthony Albanese's policies on, on Beijing are not black and white. They're, in fact, when it comes to being uh, supporting the Australian government on these difficult issues, generally they've come down on the right side. So I want to ask you, um, uh, something, I saw recent, uh, a recent interview of Sherry Markson and yourself, uh, where Sherry asks you about the freedom of speech uh, regarding China um, with the Labour Party. And I'd like to invite you to hear what answer you gave her. It might be a, a bit of a surprise for you. Let's, let's do that. As you said, Sherry, you've confirmed it. Um, I, um, I would only say that I've been as generous to them as possible. They're a, 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 a reputable organisation. I think they're a wrong-headed organisation, but it's not appropriate for uh, a lobbyist, uh, ex-diplomat, uh, to uh, make comments about a Labour Party uh, uh, ideological differences. People are perfectly entitled to stand up to the Tibetans 
that are trending in the way that people that are in concentration camps in China um, ought to be more alarmed uh, about China's activities in the South China Sea, Hong Kong and Taiwan than China knows. So, um, you know, let's just stick to the, to the issues. Um, it's not appropriate for people to come along and try and enforce some kind of uh, ideological conformity. Okay, okay. so, so I, I want to, uh, as, as you saw, Michael, um, Sherry asked you about the freedom China of speech in regards to China and the Labour Party, and yeah. you gave her a, a, a wishy-washy answer. I'd like you to give me, on Frank Talk, a frank answer. <laughs> you can tell we're friends. <laughs> <laughs> we, yeah, we are definitely friends. Uh, but if we weren't friends, was, I would say the uh, same Rudd's, thing. What I was talking about was Rudd's former... Um, Department Head of Foreign Affairs coming along to the uh, Labor Party shadow cabinet and telling members of the Victorian right that they are not allowed to speak out um, on matters to do with China. Um, and that is completely uh, illegitimate. It's okay for him to go along and talk to the shadow cabinet. That, that, that's kosher. Um, but um, he and his um, offsider from the Sydney Morning Herald, Eric Bagshaw, attacked me because I say they shouldn't be enforcing ideological conformity. So what they're doing is they're trying to cow people, trying to get them to shut up um, about um, our strong views on the concentration camps for the Uyghurs, on the crackdown in Hong Kong, and on the Chinese aggression towards Taiwan. We're not going to shut up. So I've got a message for Alan Vingel. You can talk as much as you like, but um, uh, you're not going to intimidate me. In fact, Albert, I think you'd, you'd a lot of people would admit it that my views on China over the last 10 years, uh, from the initial opposition uh, to Huawei uh, bidding for the uh, NBN, um, uh, and my opposition to the extradition treaty of Australia that Julie Bishop supported with, uh, uh, with China, have been proved right. And it's not, I don't take any uh, nachos, any derived pleasure from that. It's China's uh, Beijing's uh, aggression since Xi Jinping became virtual dictator. He, like Putin, is now there for life. And you can see it in the military build-up. You can see it in uh, China's deck diplomacy with all of these uh, uh, countries. And you can see it with his strategic plan, which is what the Belt Road Initiative is. It's not some economic um, idea that, you know, the Victorian treasurer, Tim Pallas, can get some cheap money from. Uh, that's wrong. The idea is uh, to try and get economic heft into countries which you will then exert strategic influence over. I can tell uh, Tim Pallas if he wants to get cheap money for Victorian infrastructure, go to Germany. They're, lend they're not only lending money to people, they will pay you to take their money because they want German money invested in safe infrastructure. Um, so it's completely unnecessary for us to have this Built Road initiative. And um, I and others won't shut up about it. But that, that's the effect of Alan Gingell appearing before the shadow cabinet. Writing in the Sydney Morning Herald last night that we're trying to censor people. We're just trying to have that view that's been proved right over time about Beijing. We, we got it, Michael. But then I have a follow-up question for you. Um, is the, that Belt Road Initiative is also present in Israel? And uh, Israel, as you know, is very close to China. So how are you treating the Israelis on that subject? Because over there, Huawei is in Israel. The Israelis, as you know, they are very security minded. So shouldn't we say if, uh, uh, that we are a little bit <coughs> paranoid over here? Because the Israelis, they are security minded. And if they are allowing Huawei, why aren't we? Well, I. I I don't take my signals on uh, any issue from what um, um, is decided in Israel. I have a passion and a love of Israel, but I'm not um, depending my uh, attitudes to events on, on what they decide. So two things about that. You're right, Albert. The Israelis are too soft on, uh, um, too soft on uh, uh, Beijing. They are um, uh, uh, um, making a couple of mistakes. Um, I noticed that Blas Ganor, the famous advisor on uh, international terrorism, wants 
um, uh, Israel to join the, the Five Eyes Intelligence Agreement. They will only get in if they're tougher on keeping Beijing out of the Haifa port, um, which they should. I, it's not a one-way street, though, Albert. I've noticed that um, uh, recently the uh, Chinese proposal to open a desalination plant right next to the Palmachim um, uh, air base, the imp most important air base in the south of Israel where the F-35 Adiras fly out of, um, was stopped. So they are open to, uh, to pressure. I recommend to them, as I, I have at the ICT conference previously, that they adopt the Australian procedure of having a committee like the Foreign Investment Review Board give objective um, advice to the Prime Minister and the Treasurer in Israel. Um, and that would be a way of taking this out of politics and leaving it with an objective committee. There should be a couple of heads of the Mossad on it. There should be a major Israeli businessmen. I was very pleased at the beginning of when the stock crash happened as a result of this COVID crisis that we took down to zero the amount of dollars that uh, overseas companies uh, can be considered by FERB before they're allowed to invest. So um, Israel should have that, uh, that attitude too. It's, uh, uh, this is a time when, when companies are, are very vulnerable. We don't want um, hostile takeovers of the ANZ Bank taken over by um, uh, a Beijing fund that comes from out of nowhere. And uh, Michael, do you follow American politics? Do I follow? <laughs> Is Paris a city, Albert? Exactly. So um, let me ask you about the next presidential election. Uh, it's a very interesting race. Um, what's happening in regards to Joe Biden selecting a VC? I think that's becoming very topical on a daily basis because by now, normally, Uh, there should be uh, a second. What's happening there, do you know? Okay, first of all, um, um, I think Trump is going to lose because of the accumulated effect of this coronavirus. You can see that someone says there's been a change in America in the last four weeks. I thought he was going, uh, being objective and analytical here, Albert, I thought prior to February with the state of the US economy, he was going to win. So Joe Biden um, looks like, um, in my view, Uh, a strong chance to win. His real problem is um, him. Uh, whether he's up to a presidential debate, he's, he'll be 79 uh, when he goes into office. And I basically think that he's too old and that he has medical problems. So his choice of vice president is very, very important because that person may, even during the first term, if Biden's elected, become president. Um, now he's insisted that there be a woman as the vice president. Um, and since the Black Lives Matter uh, demonstrations have happened, since the tragic death of that um, uh, Mr. Floyd by that racist policeman, uh, it, it seems that it has to be a woman of color. Uh, the latest news I've got from America is that there is a congresswoman, a very famous congresswoman from California by the name of Bass. Uh, I'm sorry, I've forgotten her first name before this uh, interview. But the good thing about her is that she is, um, Uh, a centrist, um, not uh, uh, a, a person from the, uh, that uh, group, the quartet, um, and she is um, a person who has uh, been associated with the National Endowment for Democracy, for instance, which is supported by both Republicans and Democrats. I don't know her views on foreign policy. I'm told that they're quite good, but I can't give you a hexa for her because, um, you know, I'm not living in America. I think the fact that I know about her and about her existence and her possible uh, selection and possible role in the future is, is as much information as I can give you. Um, I think Trump is in real trouble, Albert. America is getting towards 150,000 deaths. And um, the governors in, in Florida and Arizona and these places have uh, really led him uh, down the garden path. Okay, well, in America, they've got a good reason to push uh, on the COVID-19 confinement and all the rest of it because they want to oust Trump out of office. What is the excuse of the Victorian government? <laughs> the, 
the Victorian government's wrong actions are wrong actions. What my opinion is why Mr. Joe Biden has not chosen a vice president yet, because they are look, they know that this is the measure by which they're going to win or lose. If they have someone very good as a vice president, and if they didn't have those silly constraints about uh, um, uh, intersectionality, if they were rather choosing the best person for the job, uh, I have I would agree with you that uh, it would be a laydown misere for Biden. But given those constraints, Michael, I don't believe that the game is over. Uh, so, Michael, uh, you've been against the Iranian deal that was signed by Obama at the time. And as we just heard, uh, there was an explosion in one of the reactors, uh, the nuclear reactors of Iran. I really don't know what the story is. Have you heard anything about that? And what's your position vis-a-vis -vis that deal um, today? I was opposed to Obama's deal with Iran from the beginning. Um, no one could restrain me here in uh, Australia in opposing it because it's a danger not just to Israel and to Jews or whoever. It's a danger to the peace of the world. And um, um, I even had a huge billboard in uh, St Kilda, in the St Kilda Junction, um, which uh, made Julie Bishop very, very unhappy with a picture of her uh, and the Iranian leader. The, the issue is that uh, it's not just one explosion, Albert. Um, it seems that the uh, possibility of cyber warfare is more extensive than we realised and that in um, all over Iran there have been many, many explosions and the nuclear program has um, uh, to some extent had a kinetic um, pause put on it by outside forces. That, that's a very good thing that it hasn't had to come to war. It's very interesting since the death of Soleimani how Iran's power has been um, cut back. Everyone who predicted that it would lead to a cataclysm, etc., talking absolute rubbish. And the fact that Israel is acting against Iran in Syria and pushing it back um, with the Russians turning a blind eye is again a very good thing. It just shows you that the, the Western uh, logic that says that only um, diplomacy, you can never use military, is sometimes wrong. You sometimes have to use a mixture of both. And I think that. A uh, real cutback in Iranian power, the death of Soleimani, the blowing up of various uh, nuclear weapons uh, precursors in Iran are all good things for the peace of the world and the peace of that part of the world in particular. So tell me about if you, they... Michael, about you personally. Uh, I feel that you're a bit of a waste in uh, uh, not being in parliament. That's where you belong. Uh, you. You were there for 21 years, I believe, um, but you're still a young man. Uh, you know, what, uh, what are you doing? What the? What the? <laughs> uh, look, uh, there's a season for everything. Um, I've been very busy since um, Parliament's over. And while we were able to travel, I was speaking at international conferences, having my say about, it, particularly about Beijing. It's very interesting, Albert. Um, Australia is the 12th largest economy in the G20. Um, we're a bigger economy than Russia. And Australians are listened to all around the world. And my views on Beijing, as I said, were ahead of the curve and were being listened to in international forums. So um, I, I'm uh, uh, busy. Um, uh, You're writing COVID a book? Are you writing a book? Uh, you want me to. Uh, uh, lots of people want me to. Um, uh, I should. I've got to get my... Uh, um, plastic boxes out of storage from the, from the back so that I can use my archives, which are very extensive, very extensive. But, but you are promising me you're not going to join Mark Letham and go with Pauline. <laughs> I started in politics for Social Democrat and I, I don't move from there. So very good. No, you're a man of your values, you're a man of your conviction. I know that's why I admire you so much. That's why we're friends. Uh, thank you, Michael, for this interview. And uh, we're lining up interviews for all our listeners and our viewers. Michael and I are going to be interviewing some very interesting people uh, in the next few days. And uh, there's going to be a lot of episodes of Frank Talk uh, that uh, are coming your way soon. Michael, thank you. Thanks, Albert. 
Thank you for watching Frank Talk on YouTube. Please leave us a comment and don't forget to hit the subscribe button.